Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I hope America is listening today. And to our witnesses, let me say welcome, and I regret that none of you were able to get into the Kansas State University biochemistry program, uh, but I uh, certainly appreciate your credentials that are all here today. I think it's important to not only identify the true problem, but also talk about where we've been. And you all can help us fill into some of the pieces here when we talk about gain of function research. It was late in 2011 when the NSABB, which is the NIH's advisory board, stopped two scientists from publishing an influenza gain of function study that I believe Dr. Ebright was referring to. And they stopped it because they were afraid it could educate bioterrorists. So this is 2011. Over a decade, over a decade ago, scientists had figured out how to make H5N1, which is highly pathogenic avian influences, more contagious. In 2012, those two scientists and 39 others implemented a voluntary gain-of-function research pause on influenza experiments. In early 2012, Dr. Fauci encouraged all influenza scientists to pause gain of function and said, and I'm quoting Dr. Fauci, 2012, it's essential we respect the concern of the public domestically or globally and not ask them to take the word of the influenza scientists. It's interesting to me that Dr. Fauci was focused on the messaging, but he still wanted to continue the gain of function research. Again in 2012, Dr. Fauci also said almost prophetically that he worried about unregulated laboratories perhaps outside of the United States, doing work sloppily and leading to an inadvertent pandemic. And he went on to say the accidental release is what the world is really worried about. I go forward to 2014 now, after biosecurity accidents in, U in the United States research labs, which our witnesses have talked about, the Obama White House implemented the second gain-of-function moratorium on influenza plus MERS and SARS because of the potential risk of lab accidents and inherent gain-of-function da danger. But gain-of-function still, still continued at the University of North Carolina, research later that we shared with Dr. Xi, the bat lady. Nevertheless, clearly the U.S. government and Dr. Fauci knew that the viral gain-of-function research was very concerning. And almost counterintuitively, while Dr. Fauci encouraged United States scientists to pause their GOF studies, Dr. Fauci offshored, that, offshored the pause research to China, not once, but twice. In 2012, Dr. Fauci gave a new grant to Peter Daszak's EcoHealth Alliance for Influenza Research in China, and then again in 2014, Dr. Fauci gave another grant to Daszak for SARS research in China. Daszak partnered with who? The Wuhan Institute of Virology. In late 2017, NIH announced a lift on the gain-of-function moratorium, what became known as the P3CO framework, which we referred to, referred to, apparently without consultation from a Senate-confirmed State Department head or national security leadership. Also significant, there was no OSTP director in place and only an acting HHS secretary at the helm. So what was the result of this? NIH essentially lifts the moratorium on their own by slipping it in between administrations and self-policing. And today, we can't see the research record for Dr. Fauci's offshore projects because the Chinese Communist Party supposedly has Eco's health records and NIH resists sharing theirs. So I'll get to my question now. Dr. Ebright, could EcoHealth's research in China have led to the COVID-19 pandemic and Dr. Fauci's worst fears that a lab accident in a foreign lab became reality. Yes. Lapses in U.S. oversight of gain-of-function research of concern may have caused the current pandemic and could cause future pandemics. The U.S. government funded high-risk gain-of-function research and high-risk enhanced potential pandemic pathogens research at the Wuhan Institute of Virology in 2016 to 2019. The research overlapped the pause that was in effect in 2014 to 2017 and met the criteria to be paused, but was not paused. The research also overlapped the subsequent policy, the P3CO framework that has been in effect from 2018 to the present and met the criteria for federal risk benefit review under the P3CO framework, but did not undergo federal risk benefit review under the P3CO framework. 
Thank, thank you so much. Report. I have to stop and point out, too, that USAID, who is knee-deep in this type of research, is part of the State Department where they can get the security advice that they should have asked for before they cleared this with P3CO. Um, certainly, I believe that this virus came from Wuhan, China, and that it is a product of gain-of-function research. This is a bipartisan national security issue, like several of our witnesses have, have testified that this viral gain of function could become, and has become, a, a weapon of mass destruction. That this model, this is a 3D model, what the COVID virus looks like, and this is the gain of function. This is the, the protein spike, the two units that allows this key to fit into the door perfectly, and the, and the, 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 the cleavage site, and, and all that. This became a nuclear hand grenade, is what happened. Dr. Quay, then Dr. Esfeld, considering the extreme risk of this research and the incredulous obstruction by the NIH, USAID, EcoHealth, and China, should Congress immediately pause this dangerous research? Uh, I think that's, a, that's an appropriate step for Congress to take. Okay. Dr. Esfeld? I think it would be somewhat dangerous to attempt to pause gain-of-function research when it's evident that that term is so malleable as to be evaded at will, and also could plausibly do damage by applying to science that is not specifically directed at potential pandemic pathogens. Are there any countries that you would say we shouldn't be doing this type of uh, research with? When it comes to identifying pandemic-capable viruses that could kill millions of people and will necessarily be shared with scientists worldwide who will be able to access them, I do not think that we should be doing it. I do not think that China should be doing it. I do not think that anyone should be doing it because it is expected to kill a hundred times as many people as it might save, even if we could perfectly prevent an identified natural virus from spilling over. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have some more questions if we have time for later, but I yield the floor back. Thank you. I want to start by going back to a comment that Dr. Esfeld made that USAID paid for gain-of-function research in China. And most people don't realize that um, because USAID won't give us the records. And we've been trying for over a year to get those records, which is why we're holding up one of their nominees uh, as well. So thank you for pointing that out, Dr. Esfeld. I'm going to go to Dr. Ebright next and talk a little bit more about EcoHealth Alliance, that they're about their record of non-compliance. Uh, they couldn't provide research records to NIH when NIH requested them. They didn't have an adequate agreement with WIV. They don't use the appropriate rate of pay for WIV researchers. Uh, there continue to be noncompliance with financial conflicts of interest policies. Dr. Ebright, based upon EcoHealth Alliance's record of noncompliance, should they continue to be eligible to receive federal funds? Their most important aspect of noncompliance was that they were informed by the NIH in terms and conditions on the notice of award for their grant that in the event they encountered viral growth in their engineered coronaviruses that exceeded the growth of the parent coronaviruses by more than a factor of 10, they must immediately inform NIH and immediately stop the research. They did not do this. So that's not merely a financial violation. That is a serious hazard violation and a violation that may be connected to the origins of the current pandemic. Uh, with that being said, uh, it is inexplicable that they were awarded subsequent federal awards and that they remain eligible to receive federal awards. Wow. I need to submit for the record, thank you for the answer, a couple of articles. First, I, I quoted Dr. Fauci. This is a an article from Science, July 2012, a handsome young Dr. Fauci, so I want to submit that for the record. And my next two questions, I want to submit uh, something from the Wall Street Journal, a couple articles as well, uh, regarding genomic sequences. Without objection. So we'll go to uh, Dr. Quay next. You may be familiar with the genomic sequences in AIH's database, I think you spoke about them, that Chinese scientists asked to be removed and how they were uh, from early COVID uh, Wuhan patients. Do you believe there could have been more data in NIH's database submitted by Chinese scientists that could hold the key to the COVID-19 origins? Yeah, this was a really nice piece of work by Jesse Bloom at the University of Washington, 
who found uh, not in the NIH database, but on some Amazon web servers, uh, the actual sequences of viruses from very early patients that had been put on gene bank and then removed before they were published and made available. And the remarkable thing is, um, again, going to another piece of good research, the virus that first came out, the first one a virus, is three mutations away from what we now know is, is probably the first virus, but that's a computational method. It's, it's kind of complicated, but anyway, there's a prediction. There are three mutations that have never been seen in humans before the first virus that we have in humans. The specimens Jesse found had some of those. So we know that there are, that the Chinese have a, a viral sequences that are ancestral to what we have. And the more of those we get, the more we'll get to the, to the bottom of this. Uh, I'll point out that these sequences were from September and October of 2019, two months before any, uh, any person in the market was sick. So again, the, the timing of the market spillover uh, doesn't coincide with the genetics of the virus. Okay. Dr. Estel, anything to add to that? No, other than Jesse is certainly one of the foremost experts in this field, and if you want probably some of the best answers that science can give, then I would recommend that you request his input. Thank you. Uh, my last question. For 20 years, NIH sponsored EcoHealth's partnership with scientists from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. The Chinese scientists have bragged that their virus sample database is the largest in the world. They took that database offline in September 2019, NIH asked EcoHealth for research records. EcoHealth told them that the records are in the custody of the Chinese government. Is it possible that the database taken offline by the Chinese government was data collected by EcoHealth and belongs to American taxpayers? Make sure they have speech. And Dr. Quay? Well, since, since the work has been funded in part by U.S. taxpayers, then by definition, uh, access to that would be important. And uh, I, I think, I also think that, that we don't have to rely on the Wound Institute of Virology from re releasing that. I believe within the U.S. jurisdiction, there will be copies of that database. It's too valuable not to have in your own possession if you're doing research on it. Do you think there's any way we can still get any of that data that's missing? I feel like, you know, somewhere we're going to find the grandfather of, of COVID or the, a cousin or something here in, in these data banks? Why, why did they take them down? And uh, I mean, what would be the advantage of them taking it down? Do you think we can ever find what we're missing? Well, it was taken down at 2 a.m. On, on September 12th, 2019, which is, I mean, I guess everyone works hard, but that's a little suspicious to be doing it at that point in time. I believe it contains closer precursors. And my, my hypothesis is it contains the one that's 50 mutations or 100 mutations, not 1,200 away. Um, and it was too obviously a, a smoking gun. But again, if you're collaborating on that and, and, and you're, you're spending 10 years building a database inside the Wilderness of Virology, you're going to mirror that database in your own facilities, which means that it's got to be at Equal Health Alliance somewhere. Thank you. Dr. Elstow, anything to add? Just note that I agree with Dr. Ebright's assessment from earlier. To the extent that China is doing this research, it's because it is scientifically sexy and glamorous and, get, and is fast, easy, publishable, et cetera. Okay. Chinese scientists have the same incentives as Western scientists in this regard. And I do not think, in fact, it's very clear that this research is not in China's strategic interest. China has no more interest than we do in handing out the blueprints to agents that can kill millions of people, including their people. This is not in the interest of any established powerful nation. And the question is, can we show leadership and persuade them of that? Because as long as we're doing it, we are making it, we are contributing to the fact that this is seen as glamorous research. It gets published in our top tier journals. Many Chinese scientists get bonuses for publishing in our top tier journals. We are driving these incentives because we persist in seeing this again as a health and safety issue rather than a national security issue. So I think it is in our power to change it. And I think this is one issue where our interests with are actually aligned with those of China and really indeed every other established nation. These are asymmetric tools of mass death. Wow. Okay. Dr. Ebright, anything we didn't ask you that we should have? Uh, that I don't know, but I ju just wanted to agree completely with the last remark by Dr. Esvel. Okay. Thank you, and I yield back. 